In those days, the crest was in service to the Shade, protectors of Hartvale. Since our arrival in Davenar, I have wondered when the Vidala would discover our presence. I'd hoped it would be shortly after we drove blades into their backs, but some wishes may never come true. Winestone and the others have brought back a man who, by all descriptions, must be Destrian Vidala, after realizing that he was following them through the streets. They subdued him and returned him, bound and gagged, to us at the Shivering Swan. How they did so on these streets is a marvel, but Winestone swears with confidence that they were not seen. Iron Gull anticipates a reprisal once they realize he is missing, so our soldiers are standing by. There's a palpable excitement in the air, though I worry about what these cultists might unleash on us. Lafelia is out on another of her walks, and I fear what might happen if she does not return before they strike. I cannot change what I cannot change, so instead I must focus on the task at hand. It is up to me to draw answers from our prisoner. What secrets will he share? What madness will he spout? Will he speak at all? I will find out soon. Welcome back for another episode of Errant Adventures. As always, I'm your Game Master and Solo Player, Steve Morrison. On this week's episode, Ben and compatriots meet the premier crime lord in Davinar. But just what does she want with them? Find out what happens on episode 53, Quid Pro Quo. Last time, Ben met with the owner of the Shivering Swan, Marigold, and she provided him some information about going to talk to the Harbor Masters to find out more about the ship in the harbor that had drawn his interest on their arrival to Davinar. Before he was able to act on that information, however, Erdira received a message from her shade contact. She took Ben, Arid, and Orchid. But as they were on their way early one morning, they realized that they were being followed. Ben was able to slip away from the group and get behind their pursuer, knocking him unconscious. They smuggle him back to the swan, but not without the Vidala finding out. Because, you see, Cleofa Vidala, Destrian's sister, has been using rodents as spies in the city. And so after she discovered that her brother was kidnapped, she begins summoning a creature to help her recapture him. After they've dropped off Destrian Vidala at the Shivering Swan, they continue on their way to their meet, where they meet Hadrius de Caro, a shade who seemingly has a previous relationship with Erdira. He tells them that they have unexpectedly a meeting with the most powerful crime lord in the city, a woman named Sidney Caliver, and that she specifically asked for them by name. Ben looks over at Arid and Orchid, and then back to this shade operative, and he says, I'm sorry, say that again? Hadrius de Caro smiles and says, I know, it's quite ridiculous, isn't it? that the most powerful crime lord in this entire city would ask for you by name. What do you mean, specifically, that she asked for us by name? She asked for the crest? No, no. She asked for you, Ben Winestone. She asked for you, Arid, and for you, Orchid, to meet with her. The three of them exchange looks, and then Ben says... Why would she ask for us? 
rather than the Lieutenant or Iron Gull. There's something not right here. He eyes the shade with speculation, and Dicaro just sort of shrugs and says, I'm sorry, I wish I knew more, but she simply asked me to convey when I saw you that she would like to meet with you. I'm supposed to bring you to her. I think at that point, Erdira says, Had, are you working for this Sydney Caliber? And Dakaro says, Well, not for her directly, but our interests have aligned a few times in the last year that I've been here, so we have helped each other out. I simply am delivering a message. Erid looks at Ben and then says, Perhaps we should return to the Shivering Swan and convey this message to Ari Superiors. Before Ben can answer, Dakaro says, I don't think you understand what I'm telling you here. Sidney Caliver wants to meet with you personally. That is not a request that you can just refuse. To do so would be unwise for your long-term health. She has people everywhere. That's part of why I started working with her, because she was able to get me into some places that even I couldn't access. I'm supposed to take you to meet with her now. We're already late having this discussion. You can't just return to your inn without angering her. She didn't ask for this lieutenant or this iron gull. She asked for you specifically. Ben and the others confer for a moment. They step a little bit away and, and Ben says, I'm concerned that this might be some sort of trap. We don't know this Takaro. Maybe he's been corrupted by the cult. Maybe this is all a setup. Arid sort of like taps his chin thoughtfully and says, It is possible. But I find that highly unlikely. After all, we were sent here to meet with him. It is not as though he stumbled upon us. These are the opportunities that uh, we are in search of. Maybe this Sydney Caliver will know more than even we could find out and will be able to help us. I think we have to consider it, at least. Orchid nods and says, I agree. And if it is a trap, well, I've got Bonator with me. Ben frowns and says, I... I'm not sure I like it, but... I suppose it's not up to me, is it? And then he turns back and says, All right, let's go. Let's go ahead and roll our next scene here. As we are going to, I think, bring the chaos factor down to six. Because even though they were being followed, they resolved that situation pretty handily and got a potential source of information back to the Shivering Swan. So I'm going to take the chaos factor down to six, and then our new setup is going to be Meet Sydney Caliver. I'm going to roll a d10 and compare it against my chaos factor of six. A two, which is an interrupt scene. Okay. This could be a very important interrupt scene, depending on how this goes. Let's see how this event focus is. 85. NPC negative. Okay, so we've got uh, our list of NPCs here, but I think I'm going to revise this list because looking at it, I've got the Fell Sword, I've got Gillen listed on there, I've got the, the King's Word, and Reinhold Philophant. And I feel like because we're in Davinar right now and we've sort of resolved the whole King's Word. Uh, cultists of Argosh thread during that last faction turn, 
I don't know that I want to distract from sort of the focus of this Vidala hunting part of the story. So I think I'm going to remove Reinhold Filifant. I'm going to remove the King's Word. I'm going to remove the Fell Sword. I'm going to remove Merrick. And I'm going to keep Gillen because Gillen is a member of the Crest. And we don't know. Gillen may have come along on this little expedition. So if we roll that. So I've got... And then I'm going to add uh, Hadrius DeCaro as a character. We haven't met Sidney Caliver yet as a character. So I'm not going to add her to the list of NPCs. So looking at this now, I've got Iron Gull, Lafalia, the Vidala family, Gillen, or Dira, and Hadrius DeCaro. Those are our characters. I'm going to roll a d6, and we'll see who this NPC negative scene is about. Four. <laughs> uh, it's Gillen. Of course it's Gillen. All right, let's go ahead and roll on action and subject. 71. Trick. And subject... 100. Information. Trick information. A trick of information? Okay, so, and this is a negative for Gillen. So, maybe Gillen is doing some scouting around Davinar, and he is going to receive some bad information. I mean, it seems as though it's most likely that this is related to the Vidala, so are they turning something against them? Or if this is a trick of information, are they using a, a trick of information to capture him? Is this a situation where Gillen is going to be sort of captured by the Vidala as retribution for the capture of Destrian? So why don't we ask the fate chart? Uh, I think it is uh, very unlikely. I'm going to even say there's no way that Gillen gets captured by the Vidala here. Cast factor of six, 34 is a no. So that's not it. So he receives some faulty information. And this faulty information is going to do him some harm. It's got to be some information about where the Vidala are and what they're doing. So, yeah, so maybe that's what it is, because maybe maybe we can expand this out from just an NPC negative for Gillen specifically, but also for the Crest as a group of NPCs, because Ben and Arid and Orchid are absent from the Shivering Swan. The Crest are all located there. They are ready for an attack. But what if Gillen returns to the Shivering Swan with information that the Vidala are somewhere reachable and iron gull decides to act on that information and send a portion of the soldiers out to strike maybe even iron gull takes a group of soldiers out to strike and that is going to weaken their position to defend the shivering swan when the vidala strike so if we are looking at our map of davinar here and our different districts there's Mudside, which is in the Stilts, which is kind of the poorer area. There's Tower Luminous, which has the harbor and Everall's Purse, where they are. There's ATR's Chambers, which is a bunch of uh, various, like, sort of middle-class housing. But then there's also a hole in the island that goes down into these chambers underneath the ground, which are called the vault. And these are places where they have mined out the bedrock of this island on which the city was built to acquire various resources. And then there is landing, which is where the sort of governmental district is, a lot of the like more upper class and then the Sovereign Spires are where the creme de la creme of society are located. I don't know that Gillen's information is going to lead them to the stilts. I'm kind of thinking it's going to lead them to ATR's chambers. And that Iron Gull is going to take a group of soldiers. So this is the scene that we see. 
Gillen returns and he comes in and he goes up to Iron Gall and he says, Sergeant, I came back uh, with some information. Thought you might want to know. Iron Gall looks at him and says, Yeah, Gillen, what's going on? Well, uh, I was talking to some merchants and I uh, heard them talking about uh, uh, strangers, a uh, strange family that had taken up residence in uh, a small house uh, out in ATR's chambers. And I managed to get an address from them and I thought you might want to know. Iron Gall looks at him and says, and you think this is our quarry? Gillen nods and says, based on what they said, yeah. yeah. They made it seem like it was some foreigners. They even said they were from Hardvale, some upper class merchants, and that they had found a, a house to live in. Everything matches up, Sergeant. Iron Gall nods and says, good work. And then he disappears back uh, into one of the back rooms of the Swan where they're staying, where Saga is in the midst of interrogating a bound and gagged Destrian Badala. And he says, Saga, I've got some new intelligence. Going to move out with a number of troops. I'll leave some soldiers behind to keep an eye on you, but if we can strike hard and fast, we can have this over with, and then we won't need this one anymore. Saga nods and says, very well, Iron Gull, I will continue my questioning of our prisoner. Iron Gull and his crew head out, and that will conclude our interrupt scene. And then we can now move into this scene of meeting with Sidney Caliver. So again, they found Hadrius DeCaro in crates in this warehouse district. And now they make their way back out of the crates through uh, one of the main thoroughfares of Everall's Purse towards Sextant. And they arrive at another inn. This one is in a much nicer spot on the island. It overlooks the harbor. Um, not quite uh, the like central part of the harbor, but the outer part of the harbor and uh, it's within view of the lighthouse. They're approaching this inn and let's go ahead and roll on Maze Rats because I do love rolling up a good inn name. Two and five, Drunken, it's a good start. And one and one, Axe, the Drunken Axe. So once again, they arrive in front of this inn. And Sextant has a certain amount of naval housing and training, like a training yard for naval officers. And they they have to walk past that area, which is probably in the shadow of Marteza's compass, this ancient lighthouse. And then they continue on down the street at this point in the day, it's like mid-morning, and so there is a lot more bustle on the streets. There are small carts that are rumbling through the streets, and people are calling for pedestrians to get out of the way. It is this bustle of a city. They arrive in front of the Drunken Axe, which is this two-story inn at one time, it was a beautiful edifice, but weather and age has caused it to lose some of its luster. But the sign itself depicts a drunken sailor holding an axe over their head. And uh, that, at least, has been maintained and uh, the paint is in good condition. And in Davinarin, Ben can see that it says the Drunken Axe. Hadrius DeCaro leads them to the door and they walk in. He says, now wait here for a moment. And he walks over to the bar, says a few words to them. And then the barkeep nods over to the staircase. 
Dakaro gestures for them to meet him at the staircase. This whole time, Ben, Arid, Orchid, even Urdira is looking around. And in this moment where Dakaro has left them, Ben, I think, turns to Urdira and says, Urdira, do you trust him? And Urdira, I think maybe we should just ask the fate chart this. Does Urdira trust him? I think it is very likely that she does. Chaos rank of six. 71 is a yes. Yes, she does. So she is going to look up at Ben and she says, Had? Of course I trust him. He and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, We grew up together, in fact. And uh, he is a well-respected member of our organization. She very notably does not say the word shade in this Davinarin inn. Why do you ask? Ben says, well, there's just something doesn't make sense here. Why would this person who we've never met, who shouldn't even know we exist, be asking for us by name? Erdira nods and says, it is unusual, but that doesn't mean that there's necessarily anything nefarious going on. Perhaps not, but it doesn't mean that there isn't. Everyone be aware for any sort of trap. At that point, Dakaro gestures for them to join him at the stairs, and they do. He says, she's upstairs, follow me, and leads them up a flight of stairs. In the mid-morning, the inn is pretty quiet at this point. They walk up the stairs, and they turn a corner into this hallway. There are a number of doors, and... When they enter the hallway, I think Orchid says, uh, Now I get the feeling that we're being watched. And as Dakaro leads them down this hallway towards a door at the end of the hall, several of these doors are open, wide open. As they pass by these doors, they can see these burly men and women with batons inside. Ben, I think, has a moment where he's like, are these gray scarves? And Arid shakes his head and says, I do not believe so. They do not wear the scarves. That is how you can tell. Ben sort of gives him a exasperated look and Arid flashes a wide smile. They reach the end of the hall and Dakaro knocks on the door and the door swings open. He steps in and to the side, making the way for Ben and the others to enter. Ben, with a deep breath and his hand hovering not too far away from his blade, steps through the doorway and into this room. He sees a decently sized room. There should be a bed in here you would think, in an inn. And a set of dressers and other accoutrements of a place to rest. But no, this looks like an office. There are chairs arranged in front of a large wooden desk. And sitting behind the desk is a woman who is thin with healthy bronze skin and white hair. She looks to be maybe in her mid-50s, but when she stands, it is with the grace and poise of a dancer. Her clothes are, are fine, and she looks at them across the table and says, Welcome and felicitations. I am Sidney Caliver, and you must be Ben Winestone of Hartvale, Arid of Anchois, Orchid of Ferramorc, and Erdira von Triken, also of Hartvale. Welcome 
to my office. Please, won't you come in and sit? I am honored to welcome you to our fair city here. I know it is no heart fail, but it has its appeal, I think you would agree. Please, sit. Ben and the others sort of look to each other and move in and sit. Now, other than Sidney Caliver, there is only one other person in the room. A woman who is in her mid to late 30s who looks as though she has fought every day of her life. She's the one who opened the door and she is the one who now shuts it. After they've settled into their seats, Sidney Caliver says, I'm sure you're wondering why I invited you all to join me here. Well, my esteemed guests, I do not wish to keep you in suspense. I'm sure you're concerned about my knowledge of your names and your heritage and are most likely wondering what, if anything, I don't know. I can assure you, my dear guests, that there are very few things in this city that happen without my knowledge. I am not here to bandy about words and offer you false promises. I know what you want. You want members of a cult who go by the name Vidala. They've taken up residence in Mudside in a temple. I will tell you what temple and how to get to them. But first, I need something from you. What does she need? When I was doing my world building episode with Matt Risby, and we came up with this character of Sydney Caliver, we determined that she would be useful to the PCs, but at a cost, and that she needed something from them, either something that they have or something that they represent. So here's the question. What is it that they represent, and what is it that they have? Obviously, they represent freedom for some people. Uh, as a mercenary company, they can go where they like, they do what they want, they find work in many different parts of the world. But she is perhaps the most powerful crime lord in Davinar. She probably could go anywhere she wants, but she doesn't. Because though she is brilliant, she also has a flaw, and that is that she is stubborn. She's holding on just a little too long. She hasn't walked away yet from this life, even though she can afford to. So what is she holding on to, and how could the crest help her to achieve that? Also during that world building, we came up with an event that was happening. A ship that is rumored to, maybe even prophesied to return, and that day is approaching. And I think she's holding out for that day. So again, what do the Crest have that she needs? I think we should ask the Fate Chart. Does she need something that they have, as in an item within their possession? Because if so, I think I know exactly what it is. Or does she need something that they represent? And if it's something that they represent, then I think she needs them to enact some part of her plan in regards to this ship returning. We have a chaos rack of six, and I think it is 50-50 that she needs something that they represent. I got 50 even, which is a yes. So yes, she needs something that they represent. So she needs them to do something. Some part of her plan requires their participation. Specifically, she needs these three because she asked for them by name. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't think it's just, oh, these are the main characters of my little story here. So of course she asked for them. 
She is a powerful crime lord, and she asks specifically for a mage, a warrior, and essentially a thief. I think she needs something. Something that she hasn't been able to acquire yet. Some item or piece of ephemera that she has not yet been able to retrieve that is going to help her on this prophesied day. And we know that this day is prophesied. So I think what she needs is she needs a copy of the prophecy. That prophecy was written down by someone and it is located in a vault somewhere, whether it is in the uh, gray scarves, uh, it's probably in the Bureau of Advancement, or, or this prophecy has been sealed away in one of the private vaults in the Sovereign Spires. Yes, she needs access to that vault. Because here's my thinking. She's a crime lord, criminal mastermind. She could easily get into the Bureau of Advancement and get something out of there. But a private collection on one of the Sovereign Spires is going to be harder to reach. So I think that she needs them because they can bypass magical means, physical means, and can steal this thing from this vault. So she says, I brought you here because I need your particular skills. And you might ask why I need your particular skills and not the skills of another group in the city. This is Davinar, after all. I'm sure you've heard the rumors that there are criminals aplenty on these streets. And it's true. We have much crime in this city, and it has made me and others wealthy. But there are certain rules in Davinar, and while rules are made to be broken, some rules are more difficult to break. And so bringing in outside contractors, shall we say, is a much more efficient way of doing business for me in this endeavor. I would have to pay off far too many people in order to keep quiet the heist that I have planned. But the three of you, the three of you could perform this. And your shade friend, of course. Yes, I know what your occupation is. It's no concern of mine as long as you are applying your trade in my benefit. You could steal this prophecy for me so that I may know exactly when this ship is returning so my people can be in place so that we can be the first to meet them and be able to control the information that they contain. Ben looks at her and says, so you brought us here. You invited us by name, which I'll admit is an impressive trick knowing who we are and where we come from. There aren't many in the city who would have that knowledge. But you have essentially invited us here to offer us a job. Sidney Caliver says, you could look at it that way. I choose, however, Master Winestone. I will continue calling you by that name, though I could call you by another. I choose to think of this as an exchange, an exchange of goods. I have information, you have skills. I would like to trade my information for the use of your skills. As the information I have to trade will help you once, your skills can help me once. It seems to me a fair and efficient trade. Ben says, We already know that they are operating out of Mudside in a temple. How is your information going to be better for us than what we already know and what I'm sure we can find out quickly? Caliver looks at him and smiles and says, You may know that they're in a temple in Mudside. You may even know what temple they're in, though it does not seem that way. 
However, you cannot get into Mudside right now. That is no problem. I can get you in there. I can point you to the temple, the exact location. I can tell you how many guards they have inside. How many supplicants are there as well who might cause you issue. I can tell you how deep the cavern is beneath the temple and exactly when they will be there. That is the information I offer, and if you think you can find that out on your own, I encourage you to try. The truth is, Master Winestone, I think we can help each other. And I know you want to get your business done quickly. So do I. From the information I've gleaned, this prophesied return is only a few weeks away. I need my people to be ready. And I know you want to finish your work and return to your fair city. I want to be able to help you in this. But nothing is free in Davinar. Will you help me with what I need so that I can help you with what you need? It's as simple as that. If you say no, no hard feelings. You can walk out the door, but don't expect me to help you with anything else. Ben looks at Arid and Orchid, who shrug. This is all the same to them. They've thieved and stolen, and what's the worst that could happen, right? A life sentence in Davinar? Ben finally looks back at her and says, You make a compelling offer, as I'm sure you already knew. Yes, we do want to get this done quickly. And that is why you're going to give us the information first. And then I will give you my word or sign whatever contract you prefer that we will help you with this task. On my honor as not only a member of the Crest, but I suspect, as you know, the family I belong to. I and my friends will help see your task done. Is that agreeable to you? Caliver sits down and smiles. And I think in this moment, Ben, looking at her, can see the weariness in her eyes for a brief moment. But that smile widens as she slides across a paper and says, I already drew up the contract. If you would but sign it, I will give you the information you seek, and then you can be on your way. You can do what you need to do, and then when you're done... You can help me. I think we're going to have a valuable partnership. And she waits as Ben leans forward, dips the quill in ink, and scrawls his name on the contract. After he's signed it, she takes it back and slides it into her desk. And then she removes a few sheafs of paper and hands them over and says, this contains all the information that you will need on the Vidala and their hideout. Good luck in your endeavors, and I look forward to seeing you all again once you're done with your hunt. I'll have all the details and arrangements ready for your mission when you return to me. They stand up, Ben offers a nod, and then they depart, leaving the drunken axe behind. As they're walking out, Erdira turns to Dakaro and says, Had, what is going on here? She knew that I was a shade. Does she know you're a shade? Dakaro nods and says, She knows a great deal. Erdira. I don't know quite how she does it, but she's been running the underground of this city for years. When I arrived, it wasn't long before I started bumping into her agents. She's been a valuable ally to me, and I have not seen her act dishonorably towards those she calls friend. If your friends hold up their side of the bargain, I have no doubt that she will treat them fairly. 
Ben, as they're now on the street heading back towards the Shivering Swan, says, That is some small comfort, for I suspect what she wants us to steal will be far more challenging than our heist of the Defara estate. But no matter, we have uh, the information we've come here for. Let's get back to the Shivering Swan, inform Iron Gull of where the Vidala are located, and plan our assault. And I think that's a good place to end that scene. Back in the Shivering Swan, Saga stands in a small room studying Destrian Vidala. He is tied to the chair, a gag still stuffed in his mouth. He's awake now, staring up at her, eyes filled with hatred and murder. She looks down at him and she says, Now, are you going to tell me what I want to know? Or are you going to continue to rot here? Like the worm that you are. And I think we should ask the fate chart. Does she get any information out of him? And I'm easily going to say that this is impossible. So there's only a 10% chance we'll use the chaos factor of 6. Here we go. 69 is a no. She gets no information out of him. At this point, I think it is right around midday. Iron Gall and his troops have left. Ben and the others haven't quite returned yet, but they're on their way back. So the other question is, is Cleofa waiting for nightfall? For her minion to do its work and to try and free her brother? Or is she brazen enough to strike in the middle of the day? I think it is likely that she is brazen enough to strike in the middle of the day. This is an 85% chance of a yes. 87. It's a no. Okay. So she is going to wait until nightfall. One more question for the fate chart. Gillen was given bad information, which he passed to Iron Gull. Iron Gall led a group of soldiers out to investigate this lead. It's got to be a trap, right? It's got to be a trap set by either Cleofa or the mother. I think it's a sure thing. Chaos rank of six. 35. That's definitely a yes. How bad is this trap? So we know that the Vidala have local guards on their pay. They have these crazed cultists who have started following them that Destrian has been recruiting and I'm sure has also been training. So they are going to walk into an ambush. But this is the crest we're talking about. This is Iron Gull. Surely they can't be surprised that much. Do the crest fall for this trap? I think there's no way that they fall for this trap. 91 is a no. Saga continues to interrogate Destrian Badala, but he says nothing to her. Even after Ben and the others have returned and she's stepped away to hear this information that they brought back, she tries to use that information to break him open, but he just stares at her with even more hatred. And then, maybe an hour or two later, Iron Gull and the rest of the crest re-enter the Shivering Swan. They look a little more worn than when they left, and Gillen is sporting a fresh wound on his side, as are several others in the crest. 
Iron Gull just looks angry. He walks into the small room where Destrian Vidala is being held. And after Ben informs him of the information that they have, Iron Gull turns and looks at Destrian. There's pain on Iron Gull's face as he steps over to the man and he says, Your people laid an ambush for us. They got four of our number. It's impressive. You must have trained them well. There's a look of triumph on Destrian's face for a moment. Iron Gull smiles and says, Don't worry. We didn't leave any of yours left alive to keep fighting. And since we know where your sister and your mother are now, I can fulfill at least part of my contract right now. And he draws his blade and he drives it through Destri and Vidala's heart. Thanks for listening to Errant Adventures, and thank you so much to Sirenscape for the lovely ambient sounds and music throughout the episode. If you enjoyed the show, please tell anyone and everyone in your life about it. And if you want to support the show directly, leave me a review or buy me a coffee at coffee.com slash errantadventures. That's ko-fi.com slash errantadventures. If you want to interact with me, my handle on Instagram and Twitter is at errantsolopod, or you can email me at errantsolopod at gmail.com. I also post short fiction and campaign-related materials on my website, errantadventurespod.com. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time. Are you looking for a D&D podcast with a dark side? Something more like Game of Thrones and less like Monty Python? Tale of the Manticore is part dark fantasy audio drama, part solo D&D RPG. There's no plot armor here. The dice make all the important decisions. Join me as I resurrect the excitement, wonder, and emotion of old school D&D. Made for a mature audience, Tale of the Manticore is both a fiction and a game. It's the story where chaos rolls.